Anglo-Saxon England or Early Medieval England, existing from the 5th to the 11th centuries from soon after the end of Roman Britain until the Norman Conquest in 1066, consisted of various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms until 927, when it was united as the Kingdom of England by King Athelstan. It became part of the short-lived North Sea Empire of Nut, a personal union between England, Denmark and Norway in the 11th century. The Anglo-Saxons migrated to Britain from mainland northwestern Europe after the Roman Empire withdrawal from the Isle at the beginning of the 5th century. Anglo-Saxon history thus begins during the period of sub-Roman Britain following the end of Roman control, and traces the establishment of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in the 5th and 6th centuries. Their Christianization during the 7th century, the threat of Viking invasions and Danish settlers, the gradual unification of England under the Wessex hegemony during the 9th and 10th centuries, and ending with the Norman conquest of England by William the Conqueror in 1066. The Normans persecuted the Anglo-Saxons and overthrew their ruling class to substitute their own leaders for the purposes of overseeing and ruling England. However, Anglo-Saxon identity survived beyond the Norman conquest, came to be known as Englishry under Norman rule, and through social and cultural integration with Romano-British Celts, Danes and Normans became the modern English people. As the Roman occupation of Britain was coming to an end, Constantine III withdrew the remains of the army in reaction to the Germanic invasion of Gaul with the crossing of the Rhine in December 406. The Romano-British leaders were faced with an increasing security problem from seaborne raids, particularly by Picts on the east coast of England. The expedient adopted by the Romano-British leaders was to enlist the help of Anglo-Saxon mercenaries, to whom they ceded territory. In about 442 the Anglo-Saxons mutinied, apparently because they had not been paid. The Romano-British responded by appealing to the Roman commander of the Western Empire, Magister Militia Maecius, for help. Even though Honorius, the Western Roman Emperor, had written to the British Civitas in or about 410 telling them to look to their own defence. There then followed several years of fighting between the British and the Anglo-Saxons. The fighting continued until around 500, when, at the Battle of Mount Badon, the Britons inflicted a severe defeat on the Anglo-Saxons. There are records of Germanic infiltration into Britain that date before the collapse of the Roman Empire. It is believed that the earliest Germanic visitors were eight cohorts of Batavians attached to the 14th Legion in the original invasion force under Aulus Plautius in AD 43. There is a recent hypothesis that, some of the native tribes, identified as Britons by the Romans, may have been Germanic language speakers, but most scholars disagree with this due to an insufficient record of local languages in Roman period artifacts. It was quite common for Rome to swell its legions with federati recruited from the German homelands. This practice also extended to the army serving in Britain. And graves of these mercenaries, along with their families, can be identified in the Roman cemeteries of the period. The migration continued with the departure of the Roman army, when Anglo-Saxons were recruited to defend Britain, and also during the period of the Anglo-Saxon First Rebellion of 442. If the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is to be believed, the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms which eventually merged to become England were founded when small fleets of three or five ships of invaders arrived at various points around the coast of England to fight the sub-Roman British, and conquered their lands. The language of the migrants, Old English, came over the next few centuries to predominate throughout what is now England. At the expense of British Celtic and British Latin. The arrival of the Anglo-Saxons into Britain can be seen in the context of a general movement of Germanic peoples around Europe between the years 300 and 700, known as the Migration Period. In the same period there were migrations of Britons to the Armorican Peninsula, initially around 383 during Roman rule, but also 460 and in the 540s and 550s, the 460s migration is thought to be a reaction to the fighting during the Anglo-Saxon mutiny between about 450 to 500, as was the migration to Britonia at about the same time.
the historian Peter Hunter Blair expounded what is now regarded as the traditional view of the Anglo-Saxon arrival in Britain. He suggested a mass immigration, with the incomers fighting and driving the sub-Roman Britons off their land and into the western extremities of the islands, and into the Breton and Iberian peninsulas. This view is based on sources such as Bede, who mentions the Britons being slaughtered or going into perpetual servitude. According to Hark the more modern view is of coexistence between the British and the Anglo-Saxons. He suggests that several modern archaeologists have now reassessed the traditional model, and have developed a coexistence model largely based on the laws of INE. The laws include several clauses that provide six different Wergild levels for the Britons, of which four are below that of freemen. Although it was possible for the Britons to be rich freemen in Anglo-Saxon society, generally it seems that they had a lower status than that of the Anglo-Saxons. Discussions and analysis still continue on the size of the migration, and whether it was a small elite band of Anglo-Saxons who came in and took over the running of the country, or a mass migration of peoples who overwhelmed the Britons. An emerging view is that two scenarios could have co-occurred, with large-scale migration and demographic change in the core areas of the settlement and elite dominance in peripheral regions. According to Gildas, initial vigorous British resistance was led by a man called Ambrosius Aurelianus, from which time victory fluctuated between the two peoples. Gildas records a final victory of the Britons at the Battle of Mount Badon in 500, and this might mark a point at which Anglo-Saxon migration was temporarily stemmed. Gildas said that this battle was 44 years and one month after the arrival of the Saxons, and was also the year of his birth. He said that a time of great prosperity followed. But, despite the lull, the Anglo-Saxons took control of Sussex, Kent, East Anglia and part of Yorkshire, while the West Saxons founded a kingdom in Hampshire under the leadership of Churdich, around 520. However, it was to be fifty years before the Anglo-Saxons began further major advances. In the intervening years the Britons exhausted themselves with civil war, internal disputes, and general unrest, which was the inspiration behind Gildas's book De Exidio Britanniae, The Ruin of Britain. The next major campaign against the Britons was in 577. Led by Selin, King of Wessex, whose campaign succeeded in taking Cirencesta, Gloucester and Bath, known as the Battle of Durham. This expansion of Wessex ended abruptly when the Anglo-Saxons started fighting among themselves and resulted in Selin retreating to his original territory. He was then replaced by Sal Southern Britain in AD 600 after the Anglo-Saxon settlement, showing division into multiple petty kingdoms Anglo-Saxon and British kingdoms 800. Selin was killed the following year, but the annals do not specify by whom. Cirencesta subsequently became an Anglo-Saxon kingdom under the overlordship of the Mercians, rather than Wessex. By 600, a new order was developing, of kingdoms and subkingdoms. The medieval historian Henry of Huntingdon conceived the idea of the Heptarchy, which consisted of the seven principal Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. By convention, the Heptarchy period lasted from the end of Roman rule in Britain in the 5th century, until most of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms came under the overlordship of Egbert of Wessex in 829. This approximately 400-year period of European history is often referred to as the Early Middle Ages or, more controversially, as the Dark Ages. Although Heptarchy suggests the existence of seven kingdoms, the term is just used as a label of convenience and does not imply the existence of a clear-cut or stable group of seven kingdoms. The number of kingdoms and sub-kingdoms fluctuated rapidly during this period as competing kings contended for supremacy. At the end of the 6th century the most powerful ruler in England was Athelstan of Kent, whose lands extended north to the River Humber. In the early years of the 7th century, Kent and East Anglia were the leading English kingdoms. After the death of Athelbert in 616, Raedwald of East Anglia became the most powerful leader south of the Humber. Following the death of Athelfrith of Northumbria, Radwald provided military assistance to the Dayran Edwin in his struggle to take over the two dynasties of Dara and Bernishnisha in the unified kingdom of Northumbria. 
upon the death of Radwald. Edwin was able to pursue a grand plan to expand Northumbrian power. The growing strength of Edwin of Northumbria forced the Anglo-Saxon Mercians under Penda into an alliance with the Welsh king Cadwallon A.P. Cadfan of Gwynedd, and together they invaded Edwin's lands and defeated and killed him at the Battle of Hatfield Chase in 633. Their success was short-lived, as Oswald defeated and killed Cadwallon at Heavenfield near Hexham. In less than a decade Penda again waged war against Northumbria, and killed Oswald in the Battle of Maserfield in 642. His brother Oswiu was chased to the northern extremes of his kingdom. However, Oswiu killed Penda shortly after, and Mercia spent the rest of the 7th and all of the 8th century fighting the kingdom of Powys. The war reached its climax during the reign of Offa of Mercia, who is remembered for the construction of a 150-mile-long dike which formed the Wales-slash-England border. It is not clear whether this was a boundary line or a defensive position. The ascendancy of the Mercians came to an end in 825, when they were soundly beaten under Bjornwolf at the Battle of Ellendun by Egbert of Wessex. Christianity had been introduced into the British Isles during the Roman occupation. The early Christian Berber author, Tertullian, writing in the 3rd century, said that, Christianity could even be found in Britain. The Roman Emperor Constantine, granted official tolerance to Christianity with the Edict of Milan in 313. Then, in the reign of Emperor Theodosius the Great, Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire. It is not entirely clear how many Britons would have been Christian when the pagan Anglo-Saxons arrived. There had been attempts to evangelize the Irish by Pope Celestine I in 431. However, it was St. Patrick who is credited with converting the Irish en masse. A Christian Ireland then set about evangelizing the rest of the British Isles, and Columba was sent to found a religious community in Iona, off the west coast of Scotland. Then Aidan was sent from Iona to set up his see in Northumbria, at Lindisfarne, between 635 and 651. Hence Northumbria was converted by the Celtic Church. Bede is very uncomplimentary about the indigenous British clergy, in his Historia Ecclesiastica he complains of their unspeakable crimes, and that they did not preach the faith to the Angles or Saxons. Pope Gregory I sent Augustine in 597 to convert the Anglo-Saxons, but Bede says the British clergy refused to help Augustine in his mission. Despite Bede's complaints, it is now believed that the Britons played an important role in the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons. On arrival in the southeast of England in 597, Augustine was given land by King Athelbert of Kent to build a church. So in 597 Augustine built the church and founded the see at Canterbury. Athelbert was baptized by 601, and he then continued with his mission to convert the English. Most of the north and east of England had already been evangelized by the Irish Church. However, Sussex and the Isle of Wight remained mainly pagan until the arrival of St. Wilfred, the exiled Archbishop of York, who converted Sussex around 681 and the Isle of Wight in 683. It remains unclear what conversion actually meant. The ecclesiastical writers tended to declare a territory as converted merely because the local king had agreed to be baptized, regardless of whether, in reality, he actually adopted Christian practices. And regardless, too, of whether the general population of his kingdom did. When churches were built, they tended to include pagan as well as Christian symbols, evidencing an attempt to reach out to the pagan Anglo Saxons, rather than demonstrating that they were already converted. Between the 8th and 11th centuries, raiders and colonists from Scandinavia, mainly Danish and Norwegian, plundered Western Europe, including the British Isles whose raiders came to be known as the Vikings, the name is believed to derive from Scandinavia, where the Vikings originated. The first raids in the British Isles were in the late 8th century, mainly on churches and monasteries. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reports that the holy island of Lindisfarne was sacked in 793. The raiding then virtually stopped for around 40 years, but in about 835, 
it started becoming more regular. In the 860s, instead of raids, the Danes mounted a full-scale invasion. In 865, an enlarged army arrived that the Anglo-Saxons described as the Great Heathen Army. This was reinforced in 871 by the Great Summer Army. Within ten years nearly all of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms fell to the invaders, Northumbria in 867, East Anglia in 869, and nearly all of Mercia in 874-877. Kingdoms, centers of learning, archives, and churches all fell before the onslaught from the invading Danes. Only the Kingdom of Wessex was able to survive. In March 878, the Anglo-Saxon King of Wessex, Alfred, with a few men, built a fortress at Athelney, hidden deep in the marshes of Somerset. He used this as a base from which to harry the Vikings. In May 878 he put together an army formed from the populations of Somerset, Wiltshire, and Hampshire, which defeated the Viking army in the Battle of Eddington. The Vikings retreated to their stronghold, and Alfred laid siege to it. Ultimately the Danes capitulated, and their leader Guthrum agreed to withdraw from Wessex and to be baptized. The formal ceremony was completed a few days later at Wedmore, there followed a peace treaty between Alfred and Guthrum, which had a variety of provisions, including defining the boundaries of the area to be ruled by the Danes and those of Wessex. The Kingdom of Wessex controlled part of the Midlands and the whole of the south, while the Danes held East Anglia and the north. After the victory at Eddington and resultant peace treaty, Alfred set about transforming his Kingdom of Wessex into a society on a full-time war footing. He built a navy, reorganized the army, and set up a system of fortified towns known as Buzz. He mainly used old Roman cities for his Buzz, as he was able to rebuild and reinforce their existing fortifications. To maintain the Buzz, and the standing army, he set up a taxation system known as the Berghal Heidage. These buzz operated as defensive structures. The Vikings were thereafter unable to cross large sections of Wessex. The Anglo Saxon Chronicle reports that a Danish raiding party was defeated when it tried to attack the Bow of Chichester. Although the buzz were primarily designed as defensive structures, they were also commercial centers, attracting traders and markets to a safe haven, and they provided a safe place for the king's moneyers and mints. A new wave of Danish invasions commenced in 891, beginning a war that lasted over three years. Alfred's new system of defense worked, however, and ultimately it wore the Danes down, they gave up and dispersed in mid-896. Alfred is remembered as a literate king. He or his court commissioned the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was written in Old English. Alfred's own literary output was mainly of translations, but he also wrote introductions and amended manuscripts. From 874 to 879 the western half of Mercia was ruled by Seowulf II, who was succeeded by Athelred as Lord of the Mercians. Alfred the Great of Wessex styled himself King of the Anglo-Saxons from about 886. In 886-887 Athelred married Alfred's daughter Athelflaed. On Alfred's death in 899, his son Edward the Elder succeeded him. When Athelred died in 911, Athelflaed succeeded him as Lady of the Mercians, and in the 910s she and her brother Edward recovered East Anglia and Eastern Mercia from Viking rule. Edward and his successors expanded Alfred's network of fortified buzz, a key element of their strategy, enabling them to go on the offensive. When Edward died in 924 he ruled all England south of the Humber. His son, Athelstan, annexed Northumbria in 927 and thus became the first king of all England. At the Battle of Brunanburh in 937, he defeated an alliance of the Scots, Danes, and Vikings and Strathclyde Britons. Along with the Britons and the settled Danes, some of the other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms disliked being ruled by Wessex. Consequently, the death of a Wessex king would be followed by rebellion, particularly in Northumbria. Alfred's great-grandson, Edgar, who had come to the throne in 959, 
was crowned at Bath in 973 and soon afterwards the other British kings met him at Chester and acknowledged his authority. The presence of Danish and Norse settlers in the Danelaw had a lasting impact. The people there saw themselves as armies, a hundred years after settlement. King Edgar issued a law code in 962 that was to include the people of Northumbria, so he addressed it to Earl Olac and all the army that live in that earldom. There are over 3,000 words in modern English that have Scandinavian roots, and more than 1,500 place names in England are Scandinavian in origin, for example, topographic names such as Howe, Norfolk and Howe, North Yorkshire are derived from the Old Norse word hogger meaning hill, knoll, or mound.